Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back. Uh, at this point, we go around the, in, uh, the room and introduce ourselves by first name. I encourage you to take a breath before you say your name. Uh, I'll begin. My name is Michael. I'm Brad. Jack. I'm Tristan. My name is Ray. Jeff. <coughs> Matthew. Larry. My name is Jerry. Jim. I'm Bob. Don. My name is Harley. My name is Cass. I'm Juan. Mark. I'm Greg. I'm Shantanu. I'm Brian. I'm Steve. I'm Mick. I'm Grisha. Stefan. I'm Mike. John. Peter. My name is Joe. Christian. And this is Alistair. Um, welcome, welcome back, Alistair. Hi, I'll remember everybody's <laughs> name. <laughs> uh, so Alistair Shanks has been a dedicated practitioner and teacher of the Taoist internal martial arts for over 20 years. Since 2008, he has been an adjunct faculty member at the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine, slash CIIS, where he teaches Tai Chi. Alistair has been a volunteer with Zen Hospice Project and was hired to serve as the volunteer program manager in 2016. <coughs> His other volunteer works include working as a Buddhist chaplain at San Francisco General Hospital and leading meditation sessions for inmates in the San Francisco County Jail. In his spare time, he plays with San Francisco's legendary hardcore polka band, Polka Side. <laughs> Welcome, Alistair. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's lovely to be back here. Um, <coughs> I had a hell of a time trying to decide what to talk about today, and it um, seems like uh, I get interested in one thing for a while, and then something else catches my attention. But what I chose to talk about is grief and impermanence. Um, so I, I'd like to start by just reading a couple of quotes. At the heart of grief lies an irreducible mystery that cannot be approached through rational thought. And Francis Weller, uh, who wrote a book that I highly recommend on grief called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, he um, is a local writer, um, well, lives up in Sonoma, actually, um, he talks about grief being the sadness at the very heart of things. And um, I think that in many ways grief is our lived experience of impermanence. Um, so I, I'm hoping to have uh, time for dialogue after this uh, because if there's something that I've learned um, in being with many groups is that everybody, absolutely everybody, has a history, has stories of loss and grief. Uh, in a way, it's, it's something that binds us, something very, very human. So it's something that we all have in common. And we're all experts in our own grief. So 
So because of that, I'd like to invite you to not just accept what I say or assume that I know what I'm talking about, um, but to, to, to really examine it in light of your own lived experience. Um, trust your own intuitive knowledge um, and what you yourself have been through. Um, this is another Francis Weller quote. He says, for the most part, grief is not a problem to be solved, not a condition to be medicated, but a deep encounter with an essential experience of being human. What I, what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to try to paint sort of a general picture of grief. Um, and then focus in a little bit more uh, closely about how that relates to impermanence and to practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start out by, by sort of casting a wide net here about what, what grief is about. Um, I was at a friend's house recently and... Um, I was looking at her bookshelf and I saw this book on her bookshelf uh, called My Life. It's a Bill Clinton autobiography. And, and I thought about what that meant, my life. We all have a, a my life. We all have a story of who we are, what we've been through. Um, really more a collection of many, many stories. Um, but we all have it. We all have something called my life. And um, it strikes me that in a way that we, we are made up of stories. Now, I know that in Buddhism, <clears throat> we're often told to drop our stories. How many people have heard that? Yeah. So, good advice, but I would uh, attenuate that a little bit by by pointing out that when we're told to drop our stories, it's often about dropping the, the rumination, the, the, the churning, the, what's called prapancha, the, this proliferation of thought that surrounds our <coughs> stories. And as we all know, our stories are on constant reruns, right? Um, they're not new. So dropping our stories doesn't mean that we deny our history. But we live in a conditioned world. We, we live from our stories. We need them. But we don't want to be attached to them. So I just want to, to hold that those two things, that stories are both important and they're, they're insubstantial. So, for me, personally, the story of my childhood would be that um, my family moved around a lot when I was young. Uh, I grew up in Scotland until the age of eight. I had developed asthma as a young child, moved to Canada, had trouble fitting in. Uh, you know, these are elements uh, of, of my story of who I am and what shaped me. But they're, they're really just thumbnail sketches. If I tell people that, underneath is this very deep underlying current. Right? A, a river of details beneath the story. I don't know if you've, you've probably had this experience where you tell someone a story about something, your life, yourself, but you realize that you're just scratching the surface. That underneath is just all this other stuff, all this juicy emotion, feelings, detail that we barely get to. So the reason that I'm focusing on stories is that some of our most significant stories are our stories of loss. 
And by loss, um, I mean everything from losing your favorite pen up to the sudden death of a loved one. So I'm putting grief in a continuum here. That loss happens in many different ways. But it's our stories of loss that I think have the most impact on us it throughout our lives. And, and again, I, w I would like to just reiterate, to emphasize that loss is not just about death. We lose things from the moment we're born when the child, when the infant realizes they're separate from the mother, when we lose a toy, when we have a disappointment, when we move. Like I said, my, my history is that my family moved a lot when I was young. And each time we did, that, was a, that represented a loss for me. might be breaking a favorite coffee mug, losing a job, a partner. Friendships, innocence, safety, dreams, disappointments or losses. So as you can see, I, 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 I'm being very inclusive here. <clears throat> excuse me, in talking about what loss is. And grief is simply our natural reaction to loss. That's all it is. Loss is change. Change is impermanence. Grief is our response to loss, change, and impermanence. And loss is cumulative. So, I I personally have have a um, my own internal metaphor. Uh, it's a it's a kind of deep felt metaphor for how I hold loss and grief. What what I come how I've come to think of it. And it's a metaphor of a well. And so what I feel is that inside of me is this deep well of dark, still water. And that water, that well, contains every loss that I have suffered in my life from birth. And when I encounter, when I suffer a new loss, it's like a bucket of water is poured into that well. And the water gets all roiled up and the new loss becomes mixed and commingled with the old loss. At the same time, it sort of awakens it and activates it. So that when we grieve a, a loss, a current loss in our lives, we frequently find ourselves feeling that sadness, that sorrow, that lack, that loss of previous experiences of loss. So again, this is my experience. This is, you know, this may or may not be your experience, but you can try that on and see, does that fit with what you know, what you have felt? And what I have found, again, in my experience, is that when I touch into that place of loss in that way, what I feel is I feel the deep tenderness, the softness of my heart. This rawness that we all have that we 
the, that, that, that deep, soft, tender, pink, trembling heart that we all protect as we must many times. So in a way, I think of grief as a portal into this very deep part of our heart. And grief can have a tendency to strip away many of the things that we rely on, that we think are important, uh, and, and bring us to something a little bit more elemental. You know, I, I had this experience once um, at Spirit Rock. I was doing a long retreat at Spirit Rock. And at that time, I was trying to train myself to sit cross-legged because my hips weren't flexible enough. And so I would sit part-time on a cushion and part-time on a chair. And I would use a cushion to support my left knee, which is, you know, I've had knee operations on it. And um, I would often come back to my um, cushion and find that the cushion I used to support my knee was gone. Someone was pilfering my, my cushion, and I would <laughs> try and get another one. And I came to notice that just close to me was a woman who had a lot of cushions. <laughs> and so she had built up a little palace of cushions to make herself more comfortable. <clears throat> And I started to notice that <coughs> her cushions kept increasing <laughs> in the same factor that mine decreased. <laughs> so one time at lunch, the lunch they, they rang the bell, the meditation was over, everybody went to lunch, and I stayed in the meditation hall by myself and I sat there. And in my mind, I was just so angry at this woman. I was I was going to take her cushions. I was going to leave her like two. I, I was going to do all of this stuff, and I was, how could she do that? That's, you know, this is a meditation retreat. And, and suddenly I, I just, I started to, to weep. Because I realized that, that I had lost something, a sense of safety because of her, but I also realized that she was a fellow suffering human being. She was suffering too. She was just trying to sit as comfortably as she could. And, and I understood that I was about to do something harmful, something, something aggressive to her. And that touched me so deeply that, that, that I, I just broke down. And I didn't take any of her cushions. And uh, it, it completely changed my experience uh, of that retreat. So that's, that's what I mean by this idea of touching in, grief, <coughs> allowing us that, that, that ability to touch into something much deeper in ourselves. Um, I'd like to go back to this idea of... Um, of small losses because, as I said, we can have the most destabilizing, traumatic, sudden loss of a loved one. And we can have the loss of something, a possession. And they, they all sort of factor in to this idea, as I said earlier, of the well. Um, so this is just something I wrote some time ago. Uh, we remember our big losses. The pain, the trauma are burned into our memories, our very sense of self. We are shaped by our losses. But I think it is the little losses, the daily ones that sting, but sometimes pass unnoticed, that shape us just as deeply. We are a mosaic, each tile representing a lesson, a person, an experience, shaped by all the events and encounters that become who we are. 
The grief we carry is also the weight of small losses, the daily accumulation of compromises and surrenders, disappointments, hurts, and unmet expectations. So as I said at the beginning, you know, every loss is a lesson in impermanence. It, losses show us that, that we're not in control. That our expectations are actually irrelevant. And there's this theory called the assumptive world. I like that phrase, assumptive world. And it kind of means just exactly what it sounds like. Is that we go through our lives um, with these really unspoken assumptions of stability, predictability, most of us. Um, in, in a city like San Francisco, an affluent city, uh, it, it's a lot different than if you live in uh, a developing country, a place where there's civil war, uh, Yemen, for instance. Um, but for us, we can conduct our lives with this assumption of reliability, predictability, stability. And um, this is what losses take away from us. They, they remove, they sort of rip the veil off that notion that our lives are stable and predictable. I have a, I have a, a friend, I had a friend, um, she was also a volunteer who um, had uh, multiple myeloma cancer for 15 years. And um, it ultimately got to the point where she had maybe, I don't know, six months to live. And she was faced with the prospect of um, her, her, her cancer had metastasized to her bones. She was faced with the prospect of you know, her bones breaking just from doing normal things. And um, her prognosis was not very pretty. So she chose to um, end her life with aid and dying to use the End of Life Options Act. And um, so on the day after labor, on the day after Memorial Day, um, I went to her house and she was there with her husband and um, her, a, a very good friend and two hospice nurses from Kaiser and uh, another friend. And um, she drank the mixture of secondol and juice and she lay back and she was held by her husband and her friend. And, and we watched her die. My own grief around this has been somewhat attenuated. I, I have not had huge outpourings of, of sorrow or tears. One of the things that people often struggle with when they suffer a loss is that their grief doesn't look the way it's supposed to look. It doesn't fit the pattern. Wait, the model says I should be experiencing this right now. You can throw all of those things out the window. Models don't serve us. I 
I trust that my process will proceed as it, as it will. But impermanence. You know, one moment Patty was there talking to us normally as any of us would. And 15 minutes later she was gone. It's hard sometimes for, for our minds to grasp that. We, we resist change. I'm attached to stability. I'm attached to the assumptive world. I get up every morning making, assuming that things are going to be continue as they are. But eventually they don't, one way or another. So grief is our reaction to this realization. Holy shit. Things aren't going to go on forever. I'm not in control. Again, to quote Francis Weller, he says that we must see grief not as an event, but as an ongoing conversation that accompanies us throughout life. Grief and loss are with us continually. respond to what can be very destabilizing events in our lives. Personally, I think one of the most important things is self-compassion. Just to hold ourselves with the deepest tenderness and love that we're able to recognize that we're experiencing something painful, something difficult, something deeply human, and to be able to feel that love for ourselves in that suffering. You know, I mean, compassion's the only rational response to suffering. that's really at the heart of Buddhism. Right? We're here because we recognize the suffering in ourselves and our own lives and we want to find out what that's about. And we also, at the same time, want to reduce the suffering for others. I will say that for many people, myself included, holding myself with love and compassion is not easy all the time. Even some of the time. I have... Um, a very uh, robust superego, the judging mind that evaluates everything I do, and that can make it difficult to hold myself with the compassion and the love that is needed in the face of loss and suffering.
one of the things that I have personally found effective um, is that if I am struggling to feel compassion for myself, is to bring to mind, to picture myself as a young boy. Um, again, something that I have done is there's a picture at my mother's house of me when I was probably about six years old. And I can tell just by looking at that picture that I had, I had asthma at that time. Like I, I can see by the way I'm holding my shoulders. I can see by the look on my face. Whenever I'm having difficulty feeling compassion for myself, if I bring that image to mind and I remember that that's me, I remember that boy, that resistance melts away. I'm able to feel compassion for that younger self who is suffering. Um, I'm going to read another Francis Weller quote here. He says, There's some strange intimacy between grief and aliveness, some sacred exchange between what seems unbearable and what is most exquisitely alive. I, I have this sense, and this is something hopefully we can talk about, in a few minutes that um, that grief is you know takes us to a place that it's the, it's the most alive thing about us it brings us to a place where as I said earlier this metaphor of ripping the veil away something has been revealed and um, in that revealing we I think can see things more clearly you know when my life is going well I have a tendency to sort of I get kind of myopic, I get kind of tunnel vision, sort of like, yeah, everything's cool. Yeah, you don't question things as much. I, I don't question my assumptions as much. And when suddenly I, when a loss happens, especially if it's a sudden loss, I'm shocked out of that state of complacency. It's not a comfortable place to be. It's, it's unfortunate to think that, um, you know, in order to uh, further a spiritual practice that we need to be shocked out of our complacency by, by painful events. And yet, that's been my experience. I wanted to mention also that um, I, that grief is um, connects us not just to impermanence, but to the other what are called the marks of existence or the three characteristics: impermanence, suffering, and no self, or non-self. I prefer non-self because there is a self; it's just an insubstantial condition self. Um, but when we lose something, we suffer. It puts us directly in touch with our suffering. And in my experience that when, when I feel that sense of loss, when I feel grief, I also feel the barriers between myself and others melting away. That separation that we all create for one another tends to dissolve a little bit. 
when I have experienced grief, I have wanted to reach out to people. Now, I understand this may not be everyone's experience. There are some kinds of grief that are so crushing that people can barely function, that people withdraw. But in many ways, grief affords us this, this opportunity to reach out to others. And that has often been my experience, that just as that woman with the cushions, I felt that barrier between us as just being no longer there, we were just fellow suffering beings. The same thing has, has happened with me in dealing with grief. Is that as I don't want to feel the separation. I need, I feel the need for support. And I see the way in which other people suffer too. I see others suffering more clearly. And again, this is this might be a, a rich area for discussion to see how many people have that experience, or perhaps your experience has been completely different. But I see this this connection in my own life between uh, grief and love, grief and compassion, grief and self love. Um, once more, I'm going to read a uh, Francis Weller quote. In truth, without some familiarity with sorrow, we do not mature as men and women. It is the broken heart, the part that knows sorrow, that is capable of genuine love. The broken heart, the part that knows sorrow, that is capable of of genuine love. And that's been my experience, that grief has cracked my heart open. I wanted to just mention one other thing. Again, this talk is not... Uh, grief is such a, a huge subject. And it's not my intention in this talk to present some comprehensive um, view. This is just sort of scratching one little corner of it. But I do want to mention this um, connection between beauty and sorrow, and beauty and loss. The, the Japanese have a term, mono no oare. And literally translated, it means the pathos of things. But what it actually refers to is this bitter, sweet quality. When we see beauty, and as you probably everybody knows, Japanese art uh, has a lot of, of you know, cherry blossoms and, and, and flowers and things like that. And as we all know, you know, cherry blossoms, flowers, but especially cherry blossoms are very, they're ephemeral. They're so beautiful. I mean, the cherry blossoms in San Francisco, when they come out, you know, in the spring, I, I, every time I see a tree with all those, you know, powder puff like pink flowers, I just feel a surge of joy. But inherent in any beauty, whether it's the youth of a person or it's the bloom of a flower, is its, its aging and demise. Is that beauty carries within it the, it, it the sorrow of its very impermanence. So in Japan, there is this idea that beauty and sorrow are inextricably linked. That you can look at beauty and feel joy, but it will be tempered by this understanding that it's not going to last. And to me, that's just... Uh, it's a very cogent metaphor for for our human life. So, 
it's 11.45, and I think I'm going to stop now and um, <clears throat> open it up to questions, comments, discussion. Yes, please. Yes, I really like the, your metaphor of the well. And uh, in my personal story, I see it's really interesting to see how losses get more with other losses. But uh, with meditation, the talks I see is a way to uh, get out of that well, water out of that well. And so it's, it's a tool that uh, overcome grief. So uh, you have other suggestions. You know what I mean. I think grief is a really huge topic, but uh, also there are tools to overcome grief. Um, I don't think in terms of overcoming grief. Mm. Uh, I don't think we do overcome it. Uh, the word that I always use is accommodation. Um, that well is always going to be there, uh, but we learn to accommodate it. Uh, our losses do not magically go away, and as many, probably everybody in this room knows that grief comes in waves, and that years later, after a loss, we may experience a wave of grief. Um, I think we learn to live with it. it. It becomes a vital part of our humanity. Um, and I understand that for some people, some kinds of losses can break them. They can be so painful, uh, so traumatic. They can, sh they can be shattering. People can literally be shattered by some kinds of losses. But in general, um, it's something that we accommodate, that becomes a part of who we are. I mean, and when I say accommodate, it's like somebody moves into your house, you know, a guest, and they're supposed to be there a couple of weeks and they don't leave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it starts to get annoying and it's like, you know, God, why is this person still here? And then after a while, you just get used to it. It's sort of like, well, yeah, I have this guest in the back. You know, they're just around. Um, so I, I'm afraid I, I can't offer any, any specific things or words of comfort other than, than that it's a part of our humanity to embrace this. There's, there's no other way uh, to do that. I think it's a I think it's a misconception that we can get over grief in in the conventional sense. Yes. So, what would you say is is a relationship of meditation to to grief? And I mean, you know, formal sit down meditation, not just generally mm -hmm. being contemplative. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and how best to use, <clears throat> use it to, to accommodate grief? Mm. Um, I think the same way that we do anything in meditation, which is to being with. Um, you know, I, I came, I'm probably, this is probably everybody in this place has a similar story. I came to a regular Buddhist meditation practice. I had been doing Taoist meditation and other practices, but I started meditating every single day for, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes from a place of suffering, from a place of loss, the end of a relationship where I was just completely bereft. And the only logical response to me was to sit down, was to start reading about Buddhism, sit down and just sit with it. And um, there may be techniques of working with grief, specifically with meditative techniques and practices. I'm not personally familiar with them, 
for me, um, it's just a matter of sitting down and seeing what comes up. And it, it has happened to me on certainly more than one occasion where I will be just sitting, focusing on my breath, and just something will just come up, and I'll, and I'll weep. I think these things will move through us to a certain extent if we allow it. But again, I, I, I can't really... I mean, I guess I would say that a, a meta practice is good for dealing with grief or a compassion practice, either one. Um, I think that when we're dealing with suffering on that level, we have to we have to send love and compassion to ourselves. We have to hold ourselves at that degree of kindness because it hurts. And what do we do when we see someone hurting? We try to, to do something for them. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I was reminded of a, a thought from Khalil Gibran, mm -hmm. the prophet. It, it's something like, as deep as you carve your well with sorrow is as much joy as you can contain. Yeah. So I like to think of those things in, in relationship, that, mm -hmm. um, that grief isn't separate from joy, like our capacity mm -hmm. to feel. If we make a decision, I'm not going to feel sad or I'm not going to feel that, we also cut ourselves off from, from feeling joy. Yeah. So I just wonder what, what you think about that as the, the, the relationship, uh, that, that the well is actually also happiness and joy. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I believe that. It's that to the extent that we cut ourselves off from our difficult emotions, we also cut ourselves off from our, our more expansive, uh, pleasurable emotions. I think that people who are able to feel deep grief also develop the capacity to feel great joy. Yes, please. And along with that is gratitude. Yes. It just baffled me. In the midst of grief, where is this gratitude coming from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and, and it, it may even be that it's, it's a, the, the, the contrast is what brings that out. It's like, oh, I've lost this and I didn't realize how beautiful and, and valuable it was, but I've still got this. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for your talk. I like the metaphor of the well and you use the word churning. I think for me, I like to think of this metaphor that when a loss comes, it kind of makes something blossom. And maybe it's kind of like a thorny weed and we want to push it away or not deal with it. I really feel that the losses I've experienced are more of, I like to view it as opportunities to maybe churn that particular one because I, I find that in my life, my experience, these similar weeds come up and go, oh no, not again. And you would think, I would think, I start to beat myself up. Oh no, not again. I'm going with this uh, familiar behavior. And yet, I love the way you said that that's where that self-compassion comes in. So I like the well, and I like the way the person mentioned about how the well is churned with, it's not only dark, but I really feel that losses are an opportunity because you get stopped in your tracks. And it's not what we want to embrace because it's, it's not the cherry blossom. That's been my experience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, again, I, I mean, I really do think there's a connection and a continuum between the, the loss and the feeling of suffering and deep grief and the cracking open of the heart and the awareness of the tenderness and vulnerability 
and the love and the, the breaking down of the barriers of separation which brings us to this sense of appreciation, gratitude, and joy. So, so yeah, I, I think that it, it's, it kind of goes against human experience for us to silo these ideas that, that they're all part of, of a dynamic experience that we have as human beings. Yes, Jeff. Um, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm reminded of being with a uh, one of those pocket books by Grandpa Children mm. one time, and having struggled with depression, uh, I spent a lot of time kind of trying to spiritually bypass it, you know, like be spiritual and butch, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, she, in her one little page she talked about of course as she's so good at the tender heart of sadness and she said Trump or Ricochet her teacher called it the genuine heart of sadness and like you were describing before I had this immediate sensation of it's not just my sadness you know like just the concept, it's the well, and I have my particular storyline about it, but uh, I felt normalized, validated, it felt really connected. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've had that same feeling, mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember that I used to think to myself when I went down into that well, and I felt all the, all that sadness. I, I would just think to myself, life is so sad. Like not just my life, but just life. Yeah. And of course, it's not only sad, but that there's that that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks for your talk today. It's very interesting because my experience, what I notice is when I go through loss, I go. I'm so hyper vigilant, and I won't. I don't even think about the grief that's going to come up. And then all of a sudden, it shows his head, and I'm like, "Why am I so sad? What's going on?" And blah 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 blah. blah. And I think, at least in my experience, I think I just was programmed that way. Like, I remember going to funerals as a child, and don't show any emotion, don't do this, don't cry. And so, um, and so it's like. I didn't think this was going to bother me as much as loss, and it did, does. So it's, uh, and it's like here I'm 66 years old, and I'm still like, geez, I feel like a child sometimes dealing with, with uh, loss and grief. And yet going through AIDS in the 80s, they were, everybody was dying so quickly, you never had time to grieve. It was just kind of like, oh, no, we have to get through next, what, what's going on next? So, so, so. Yeah. yeah. But it's not too late, but it's just. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for bringing that into the room, this, this uh, cultural conditioning that we have in, in this country to, to not show your grief or only to show it, you know, and there's the funeral, and even at the funeral, and I've heard this from other people, people were told as children, you know, don't cry. And um, I've sometimes thought, you know, I, I, I've seen... Uh, you know, news footage of, of Arab women ululating and just screaming with grief and throwing themselves on, on the, the body or the coffin. And I sometimes think that that's um, a much wiser approach, you know, to allow that feeling to move through you as opposed to standing stoically and, and trying to contain what's really uncontainable. Oh, by the way, happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go pick up my son later. <laughs> we are pretty much out. Yes, of we are. Time. Yes. <clears throat> thank you, Alistair. Thank you. Uh, so next week, our speaker is David Lewis. He's, he's beginning uh, a four-part series on the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. It, they won't be consecutive weeks, but the, it's part one is uh, next Sunday, the 24th. Uh, Donna is the Pali word for giving. 
sometimes also described as generosity. Um, our sangha is sustained by uh, by dana, and the suggested donation is five to ten dollars. Um, we support our program of wonderful speakers, the production of our newsletter, a monthly uh, dinner for uh, Larkin Street Youth Center. Uh, so please give what you can. Uh, our host today is John Anderson. John, do you want to? Feel? 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 Sure. <laughs> <There's> tea <laughs> outside. <laughs> uh, put your cups in the sink. Um, there's finger food. People go to lunch at 12.30 you'd like to join them. Um, and for the new people, there's a, a sign-up list um, for the email notifications. Is that everything? I think that was it. <coughs> so, any, any other announcements? Yeah, Michael. Oh, we've had some discussion about people who might be interested in forming some sort of social action committee amongst the brothers here. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I'm putting a list together. Thank you. I'll be around afterwards. Any other announcements? Okay, let's gather for our dedication to Paris. <laughs> benefit from our time here together, sitting in Sangha, sitting in silence, discussion, may it all go out in all directions and be for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be peaceful, may all beings be free from suffering. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.